Hello, everyone, and welcome to Little Free Library Unbound. My name is Lexi Neely, and I'm the program coordinator at Little Free Library. I am joined by our director of programs, Shelby King. She is in the chat sharing some great tips for you to have the best viewing experience today. And she will be keeping an eye out for any questions you may have, as well as um, sharing some relevant links as we go through tonight's event. I am pleased to hand things over to Little Free Library's National Board Chair, Anita Marina, who will be our moderator for today. Anita, take it away. Hold on. Let me just... All right. Can I... Oh, there you go. Ah, now you're there. Thank you so much, Lexi. It's so nice to see everybody again. And I'm really, really pleased about moderating this Little Free Library Unbound uh, episode. Um, this month, we're especially pleased to be talking about serving multilingual communities. And whether you live in a rural, suburban, or urban area, you've undoubtedly noticed that your community is diversifying. So from public cultural celebrations to new restaurants offering cuisine from all over the globe to hearing new languages and passing at grocery stores, it's very clear that our neighborhoods are more diverse than ever. And really, this rich cultural diversity makes each of our communities dynamic and special. Um, and they're also challenging, though. You know, for these new residents in our communities, um, transitioning to this new life is uh, and new place comes with a lot of challenges, um, not the least of which is language. You know, that our English is a very difficult language to learn and understand. People are, you know, really faced with trying to communicate, but also trying to connect and maintain their own uh, language um, strength and, you know, their children and then their colleague, their community is um, faced with the same. So in 2018, there was a survey, as, I, as always, um, an average of 10.2% of public school students in the U.S. were identified as English language learners, um, representing 75.2% of all ELL students um, were, were people speaking Spanish. So Spanish was a home language of 3.8 million education, uh, English language learner public school students. So that's a really big amount. So we know that in your communities, a lot of you stewards are really noticing these changes um, in their schools, libraries, communities, and in how to serve them becomes one of your biggest questions for all of us and one of your biggest concerns because we know that your heart is right there and trying to make sure that they have access to books and to resources. So with that in mind, the organizers, Shelby, Lexi, and everybody connected with the program they really have been dedicated to trying to help you find a good um, resource. So with that in mind, we have three wonderful, wonderful panelists with us to talk about welcoming these multicultural, multilingual neighbors and but also sharing the books that have the potential to reach them, to make a big impact to, on them, to have them, to help them be seen and heard and, and understood. So with that, uh, with no further ado, I'm really, really pleased to welcome our three panelists. Teresa Funk is an author, Remember Wake, V for Victory, Dancing in Combat Boots, Homefront Heroes, and she's also the blogger of Burst of Brilliance for Creative Life. She's a speaker, community catalyst, and educator. Welcome, Teresa. Thank you then, so much for having me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, we're so excited to hear what you have to say. Um, and next, I'm pleased to introduce Elisa Garcia. Elisa is a supervising librarian of Educator Collections at the New York Public Library. She's also Reforma, which is a ALA uh, uh, chapter affiliate with representing uh, um, a Latino, Hispanic uh, librarian. She's a Northeast chapter president. We are so pleased to welcome you, Elisa. Thank you, Anita. I'm so happy to be here in conversation with you all. Thank you. And finally, I'd love to welcome Laura Kleinman. She's an Oyster Adams bilingual school library teacher. Oyster Adams is in a very, very diverse 
neighborhood near and dear to my heart because I volunteered as a reading mentor for Everybody Wins for many, many years. She's a steward in this wonderful neighborhood um, of very, very vibrant, uh, you know, active uh, parents and teachers and educators. So welcome. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Laura. Very glad. So, yes, yes. Well, we first like to have each of you, we'll start with you, Teresa, and have you tell a little bit more about yourself, um, what you do, how you came to doing all the different things that you do. <laughs> and then I'll go on to Elisa and Laura. Great. Thank you. So I'm an author. And I started out writing books for adults about World War II. Each of my books are based on a real person that I interviewed. And then I started getting invited to go into classrooms to speak to children, mostly fifth grade classrooms, about writing in World War II. And quickly came to discover most of these kids had never heard of World War II. They'd never heard of Adolf Hitler or Pearl Harbor. So it was the children who asked me to write stories about the war for them, which was very exciting because I'd never written for children. And so I had to kind of go back and learn how to do that. And so I wrote, um, I knew immediately within a week what I wanted to write about. And it's called the Homefront Heroes series. It's a multicultural series uh, set in World War II. So the first book is a young girl working in a war factory in the Illinois Valley. The second book is set in a Japanese internment camp in California. The third book is based on my family's story, which was a Mexican-American family in San Antonio. And then the fourth book is set in the Bronx with a Jewish girl as the main character. And then um, the fifth book is the Pearl Harbor story. So it was, it's very fun to write a multicultural series. There's a glossary in the back of each book with um, the words from each of those languages that the kids can learn. And there's more information about what kids did in that part of the country during World War II to help support the war effort. So that's kind of um, what I do. I work with a lot of schools doing um, education, writing, and, you know, presentations about the war, and a lot of libraries, a lot of, you know, community organizations and nonprofits. And so I'm very, very lucky to do what I do. Thank you so much today. It's so interesting, and it, and it is so true. We, we have to keep um, sharing the, the stories that are so rich, and so often uh, our diverse stories are not always present in those books and in textbooks and the curriculum. So thank you for raising those up to, um, to educators and to children. So thank you. Next we have Elisa. Elisa, why don't you explain a little bit more about your role there at New York Public Library, which is such a fantastic place. But also tell us about Reforma also, uh, what Reforma offers, what it does, and how you as a librarian and how you uh, and your chapters and organization really reach and help educators, librarians, and parents um, reach their kids and, you know, provide resources. Yeah, so thank you, Anita. So uh, my name is Elisa Garcia. And yeah, so actually I'm new in this role that I, the, as the supervising librarian of educator collections. Uh, so I just started April 11th. So what I do in this role is that I manage the education collections for the partnership between the New York City Department of Education and the New York City Public Library. So um, I'm responsible for managing and developing the collections for um, the DOE along with the tri -Life Partnership, which is Brooklyn Public Library, Queens Public Library, and the New York Public Library. So it's a, a very vast um, and diverse collection um, with various materials um, for the different learning styles. So we definitely have from like audio books to large print to um, books in world languages. So um, I'm very excited about this new role and the opportunity that I get to serve um, all, all youth really from the five boroughs of New York City. Uh, so in Reforma, it's the Association for Spanish um, Speaking services and and professionals. So you know our our mission is to not just work with um, Spanish or Latinx librarians, but to work with everyone who works with Spanish speaking patrons in any library or community or setting. Uh, so our goal is to you know create professional development um, for these um, for these individuals so that they can um, learn how to work with our communities, um, but also professional development for them, leadership institutes. Um, 
doing social service, um, you know, like the Children's in Crisis Project, where we bring um, books to, uh, you know, to children and families at the border. So, you know, so things like that. So it's definitely the, the work that, that we do. Um, and then we're in different chapters in different states. So I'm, I'm president of the Northeast chapter, which covers uh, New York, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, so, you know, and the Northeast, um, Boston, <laughs> uh, Connecticut. So, and then we're just a group of, of librarians who meet and, and, you know, and discuss, you know, what can we do for the chapter, for our communities, and just develop, a, you know, also early career librarians um, into leadership roles. But it's mostly a lot of advocacy for Spanish-speaking services um, for our communities. Thank you, Lisa. That was a great clarification because it, it is al always so, so important. Um, I also uh, am pleased to say that we at Little Free Library are going to do more to partner with Reforma um, from the Children in Crisis Project to wherever we can um, really engage. We know that Reforma members and chapters have been involved in creating and extending Little Free Library, Little Free Libraries in their community and services. So this is very exciting for us to to help amplify what you do. Um, and third, but certainly not here, about your work with Boyster Adams Bilingual, I know that that was a combination of two schools when I was, when I was there volunteering. And the services that you as a library teacher, and, but also as an educator, provide and connect with um, students and the communities and the parents in particular as well. Um, let's hear more about your work, your community, um, and also your role as a Little Free Library steward. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Laura. I have been at the Oyster Adams Library uh, for 26 years. Um, I'm, on the, I'm at the primary campus, so my children are pre-kinder through third. And then, as Anita mentioned, we have a second school um, for fourth through eighth graders. So it's kind of a, an unusual split. We are a public school. A lot of people think we're a charter, but we're not. We've been a public school, a bilingual school, since the 70s. So it's one of the earliest bilingual programs, perhaps in the world, actually. Um, and. I'm honored to be, I'm glad Anita said library teacher because that's, that's who I feel I am. I'm, I'm a teacher, I believe, first and then a librarian. And, um, and that's my joy is introducing children to the love of narrative and to critical thinking and making connections. And we go back and forth between Spanish and English our children are learning, um, regardless of their home language, both, you know, children are learning English and Spanish at the same time. And so one of my most important roles, and what I believe I'm going to speak about a little bit later, is building a collection for children of books in Spanish and how we designate ca different categories of books in Spanish for children. Um, so that's something that obviously I've been doing for a long time. Um, I have a little free library. Uh, my neighborhood is uh, not, not the neighborhood that I work in, but it is a diverse neighborhood. Um, it has not been majorly gentrified, which is really awesome because that's happened in a lot of neighborhoods in Washington, D.C. And so I always have committed to put books in Spanish in my little free library. And, um, and people love them. People love them. So um, I think that's all I really need to say as an introduction. <laughs> I'm very glad to be here. It's an honor. Hey, thank you so much. Um, so as an educator, we'll, we'll, we'll go, we'll stay with you for a minute, Loda. The, um, tell us how you, how you, def how English language learners are defined. I mean, that is something that is a term that's used very often. So Loda, Loda and um, Elisa, if you want to chime in as well after Laura, you, you can also add your perspective, but, but it is a designation. Um, for schools, not just public schools, but, but pretty much in long place, other places, so. Well, 
I am not a reading teacher, right? So, right. Um, you know, we I know that there's different levels of English language learners. I am really not versed in the data. What happens okay. as a librarian is that you're teaching when the teachers are talking about the data and how the English language mm -hmm. learners are doing and what the different, you know, achievement gaps we might have between our African American students and our white students and our Latinx students. Um, so I don't think I'm the best person to answer that question technically. Um, okay. But I do know that um, walking into a library and seeing books in your native language, if you are, for example, um, a recently arrived a child from a, from a country in Latin America, I think it, it, it really um, validates your culture and your language. Yeah. And our Spanish-speaking children need to help our English-speaking children um, with language and with um, comprehension. With understanding, yeah. With understanding, exactly, comprehensible input and all of that. So um, I'm sorry I can't be a little no, no, that's more okay. technical. So, but Elisa, Elisa, I, I know that the technical part is not, is not, uh, not necessary. Elisa, I can have you expand. And also I think the other thing is, um, uh, and Elisa, you can talk about that. That the that Spanish speakers, uh, they're they're different, and their their countries are different. That the words that they use are often different. Um, coming from my husband, when went from Mexico to Venezuela, very very different. And it was it was a very different rhythm and speaking and slang and so on. So Elisa, and and also uh, since you. Uh, and the forma and librarians like you will also specialize in services for Spanish-speaking um, communities. Tell us more about um, the challenges for English language learners, particularly right now since we're focused a lot on Spanish speakers since they're, they're the majority. Um, if you could elaborate a little bit on that. And so, so Laura, don't worry. We're, okay. We don't need technical All right. <laughs> experiences. All right. So go ahead, Elisa. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, so I don't have very technical uh, information, but I'll start off with this. So, um, I was an English language learner myself. So, I, with my case, I, when I was growing up in the Dominican Republic, like, and, you know, I finally came to live here, I think, when I was like six or five or six. But I was going to an American school while living in the Dominican Republic, and I was, I was, I was learning English. It was an American school. But I was learning the basics, like the, you know, like this is like a dog, the alphabet, like spelling and like those. So when I finally came to, when we, you know, my mom and I came to live to the U.S., I was an English language learner myself because I, I was, I needed to learn how to read fully, like in English and all that. So definitely, so there's differences between what an English language learner is because I can use the example of, of kids who have, when I, in my previous role, I used to be the head of team services at the Bronx Library Center. We, we would work with the multi, um, multi learners, multilingual learners from the local high school. We had kids from Africa who knew a little bit of English or who came from other places, but they were still being considered English language learners. So I think, you know, this is, so it gets tricky. It's very complicated. So I, I understand when Laura is like, you know, I, I, I don't have the technical because it's like, yeah, there, there's, you know, it, it's, 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 it's not as, as simple. Not as, as clean. It's, yeah. It's not as clean. So there's, yeah. so I think, yeah. So I think for me, an English language learner is a person who, um, it's just a, let's, a, a youth or a person who's coming into into a, a this into this country to learn a very a language that's very complicated and complex, but you know they they also so they're trying to navigate between having the language that they know from home yeah. and then trying to combine it with this. So I think it's like someone for me an English language learner, someone who's trying to like figure out the basics of what this language is so they can comprehend in order to move forward in their studies or whatever they're trying to to do. So it's like so it, it's a very it, it's very tricky because you also have adults that are English language learners and all of that. So I think there's not a clear cut cookie cutter type of thing. And also I'm not a, I'm not a, a second language 
teacher. I'm not, so yeah. not I'm not so I probably don't have those skills. But the way we've worked with those um what I've worked with those particular that particular population is that we show them books in their in their languages as well, their native languages. But we also pair them, hey, this is the English version of this. So if you want to like read what what is here, what is there, so that you can compare and contrast. I find that graphic novels are very are easier also to introduce a second language learner because there is graphics, there's a picture that's explaining that. And so, yeah, so it's just a combination. So it's finding multiple ways to serve as a librarian to serve that that per, that population. Um, and also thinking of myself of when I was learning as a six and five years, the ways that I, how I learned, is a lot of repetition, a lot of, um, and just listening to. Um, and I think the last thing you want to touch me on was when the challenges on serving. Um, is that, yeah. yeah. So, the challenge is sometimes is not having the staff that speaks the native language of, of you know, the people who come in. So that's also, or not, yeah, so that's one of, one of the challenges. Or not having the services or the collections to be able to share with, um, with the students or the patrons coming in. So I think that's definitely one of the, one of the challenges. And then sometimes you have the staff who maybe they don't speak that language, but they don't have the resources. So there's different, you know, there's different, uh, different challenges within. But I, I think, um, I think we're improving. There's a lot of work that still needs to be done, but I feel that there's, there's an improvement um, and going towards that. And then you have, people like Laura who are dedicating themselves to doing this type of work. So I think yes. that's just what it is. So, and then just last day, just want to say that just because someone's an English language learner, it doesn't mean that they're not, um, they're not as smart, they're not as smart. Right. I think that judgment needs to like, it needs we to We need to go. put that away. Yeah, yes. that needs it, to go. So, yeah. Exactly, because um, for one, English is a really difficult language to learn. Um, Teresa, as, a, as an author, you know, just the use of words um, in, in writing, you know, the, and thinking of, of a child who, or an, in an adult who has to navigate um, an environment that is so different than, than them, um, it's, it's so tough, you know, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I wanted so, to um, just add to that, that my mom was an English language learner, um, teacher, so an ELL teacher. And I think, first of all, I'm really glad that you mentioned that not all Spanish speakers have exactly the same language, <laughs> because it, is, it varies even within a country. Yes. So, you know, when we, were, when we were doing the translation to my book, V for Victory, and we were translating it into Spanish, my book is about a Mexican-American character. So we had to think about what would a child who was raised by parents from Mexico how would he talk, but how would he integrate the language and the slang he'd picked up in the United States from his Spanish-speaking friends? And we were writing a book that said in the 1940s. So you're looking at, historically, did this word exist at that time in English or Spanish? So we had all kinds of challenges in addition to my main character's 12. So we think about there is a difference in Spanish between the way a 12-year-old might phrase a sentence than the way an adult would. Mm -hmm. So yeah. all of that had to go into consideration when we translated the book. So um, I think that's really a fascinating uh, nuance for people to understand is that even within Spanish, there's going to be variations, even within um, cultures that speak Spanish, like Mexico has indigenous languages as well. So, right. but the EL ELL learning that my mom encountered, one more thing I wanted to say about that is that some kids are coming over knowing a little bit of, of English. Other kids are coming over with no English, especially those who are refugees who are fleeing, let's say, a war-torn situation. Yep. And everything about this culture is relatively new to them, not just the language. And they don't have an English background, but they also may have been through some trauma. And so understanding that that's part of encouraging them is that if they've been through that trauma and now they're dropped down into this culture and this language that they don't understand, um, sometimes for some of them it, it, it means a little extra TLC. And that's certainly not all, all English language learners at all. But I did want to bring up that part of the population.
-hmm. And that brings to mind Elisa and also Lourdes um, comments that the, the need for services, the need for that kind of resources for the educators and librarians and, um, and also education support professionals who are reaching and working with these children and their parents every day. And I think, as you said, most places, like the U.S., regionally is different. So we have different languages from the south to the north to the east to the west. So it's not surprising that those same differences occur and challenges occur. Um, so I know that there are a lot of the Little Free Library stewards who, who don't speak a second language, such as Spanish. Um, what advice would you give them in helping them select books for their neighbors, um, who may speak another language at home. Um, I'll circle back to you, Lola and Elisa, if you, the three of you each want to take a turn for that. Um, this is a great conversation already, so I'm, I'm hooked. So. <laughs> I want to mention a couple of things. One of the things that I really think we need to emphasize and amplify is the difference in the Spanish language use in, in Latin America, in Latinx communities in the United States and then Spain as well. Yes. Um, just a, a sort of a, I have a couple of examples. Um, the audio de Greg, right? So translations are a big part of children's literature in Spanish. And one of the interesting things about the audio de Greg, which is Diary of a Wimpy Kid in Spanish, is that the slang is from Spain, right? So these uh. middle schoolers are speaking slang and some of our Spanish language learners or Spanish language speakers are not going to understand some pieces of this book, whereas they would if they were, you know, native English speakers, they would understand it um, in English. The other, I think, really important point, for me anyway, is something called translanguaging. Um, there used to be sort of this, this really strict um, separation of the languages and, you know, you can't pollute English with Spanish or Spanish with English and that has completely been thrown out and I want to, maybe if, if Lexi's putting some links, um, Dr. Jose Medina, he is a linguist and many other things and he is one of the biggest advocates of Spanglish and mm -hmm. That's a translanguaging um, experience of, and it really is what happens in many, many, many Latinx families. So one type of book that's coming out right now, which is really fun, is something like Little Roja Riding Hood, right? So on every page there's, um, and it's really, really, this woman, um, Susan Middleton Elia is amazing. And she rhymes in English and Spanish. Um, so I, this is sort of a sub-genre of bilingual books, which are different. But um, this, the idea of translanguaging, the idea that it's OK if a child uses English and Spanish in one sentence, that, that that's their communication. And that is a valid way of communicating. Um, and then the children's literature kind of follows that. Um, and maybe I'll just go ahead and say that um, I'm a big advocate of bilingual books as well. And they used to be kind of, no, you know, those are for the public library, but in the schools we can't have bilingual books because the kids that are learning Spanish will only read the English and vice versa. But the 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 amazing thing about translanguaging and bilingual books is that these books reflect what's going on in homes, but they also reflect the culture, the bilingual culture of um, our Latinx communities. Um, and so, so in terms of genre, this genre of bilingual um, books in children's literature, this is the Latinx voice. Okay, this for me, is the Latinx voice, are the bilingual books, most many of which are based on culture of the culture of different countries in Latin America. This is from El Salvador, actually. Uh, Un tren llamado Esperanza. And um, 
train called Hope. And it's a wonderful way to, to learn about um, the, the different Latinx cultures around our country, is to explore these bilingual titles. Elisa, I'd, I'd love you to, to chime in, too, about the types of books you're looking for. Um, one thing I know that a, a, what a former ALA does is those wonderful Pura del Pre award-winning books, um, finding books in, in, in the, the languages um, with the stories being told, which are so, so rich, poets like Margarita Engel and, you know, the stories that come from Meg Medina, you know, Mercy Suarez. So tell us about wonderful books and resources where our stewards, you know, who would, not just for the communities they serve, they would love to read these books. So tell us a little bit more. So, yeah, so I actually had the honor of being, like, a committee member for the first uh, year that they did the Young Adult Awards for the Pura del Pre Awards. So the Pura del Pre, they're not, you know, just it's like the Spanish language, but just the culture or anything that represents uh, Latinx culture so that's definitely a great a great resource because these are the you know the best books that we are you know that are considered um that represent um the culture responsibly and are well written and and the many others so that's definitely a great resource um and also bank street college or uh no sorry yeah not bank yeah bank street college does also a list of like the Latinx titles and just diverse titles that, you know, that everyone could, um, you know, just read from there. But also, you know, Reforma has the plug-in Reforma there. They do the book buzzes where we, um, you know, showcase that these are the coming in titles and, you know, the titles that are that are popular that we've, um, or not just popular, but titles that are, you know, representative of our culture and that and not only in Spanish, they're also in English or a bilingual book where, you know, families and, and children and can, you know, can understand and see themselves represented, but also to others to learn from from them. I think, um, and when it comes to selecting the books, I think definitely looking up those, those resources and making sure that, um, not necessarily just peer reviewed, but that we're being just responsible in the books that we are are selecting for for our libraries and that are respectful and and representative of our culture and and of the culture and you know in a respectful manner because as the person who selects and sees books, I I've seen some stuff that I'm just like this is not not appropriate. It's not appropriate. So just being mindful of, of that. But I think using um, those resources and even your local library, you'd be surprised. Like your local library, there's a lot of resources that you can go in there and just, you know, just ask. Because normally if, you know, the, the librarians, even if there's not, let's say there's not someone who speaks the language, you will find information and stuff. And I think a, a lot of library systems are working on making sure that there's Spanish language accessibility and not just, um, you know, for all, even if the staff doesn't speak the language, even if they have to outsource or just research um, themselves. So I think I think that, like, for example, I work with the Trilight. We work together to choose the Spanish language summer reading books for adults, kids, and teens um, between Queens, Brooklyn Public, and also the New York Public. So it's like those are all um, resources that are that are out there. And just one more thing I just want to add is that we have to keep in mind that um, there is a difference between interpretation and translation. So I think that's something that we need to, because people don't, don't realize that sometimes, that interpretation is when you are speaking in real time. And that could be like your, you know, like your slang or your special dialect that you're using there. Like I, my mom is from the Dominican Republic. My dad is from Curacao. I will speak completely different from someone who grew up in Mexico. It's too, but we're speaking Spanish, but it's, it's completely like we can have completely different conversations. And translation is the written form of the interpretive of, you know, what's in it. So I think those are all the things that we need to, uh, to keep in mind as, as well. And can I say one, you um, are an author who does her research. I mean, that's the other thing. I think that Alyssa made a very good point about authentic voices and authenticity in the work and the stories. Um, I do want to give a shout out before you start. Did you want to give a shout out to Arte Publico Press and Leanne Lowe, who've been in this work? Um, that notion of telling diverse stories, but telling them with authors who come from the communities, but who have the stories to tell. 
I think it's so exciting to see our stories from our communities. You know, I'm from a, I'm Filipino, but my parents didn't teach me Tagalog or Ivatan because they were of that generation that they thought, well, you need to learn English. I'm so pleased to hear and see so much written and to see our faces and voices. So, Teresa, I know you work really hard at trying to tell the stories. Um, as an author, you know, what would you give tips to stewards who are looking for good books to place and reach uh, their communities? Well, I think um, we were talking about the difference between bilingual books, books in English, and books that are translated to Spanish. And bilingual books are, you know, they're like they're like this one here. So where a bilingual book is going to have in the, the the first language, and then so in this case it's Spanish, and then it's directly translated in English on the same page, and that's that would be a bilingual book. Mm-hmm. And, and then there's the really great books that are written that have characters from the various cultures that are written in English. But hopefully that author's done a really good job of telling either their own stories or doing really good research to make sure they are authentically telling a story. And then there are the books that are translated into Spanish. So in my case, you know, I have my book V for Victory in English, and then we had translated it into Spanish, which is Fe de la Victoria. And so um, I think it's really important for kids to be able to see themselves in literature. It's vitally important. When my daughter, my youngest daughter, is adopted from Korea, and so when she was growing up, her favorite author was Linda Sue Park, who wrote amazing books set in Korea. So she got to learn about her original culture um, through those books. And we don't have a lot of, you know, Korean people in our town, and so that was a great way for her to learn about the culture. Now, of course, we're starting to see more books written that are set in America with children that are the children of immigrants, including the Caldecott winner this year for children's picture books is actually about a child of Chinese immigrants. And so it's really fantastic to see since, since Own Voices, the movement Own Voices and the movement We Want Diverse Books really brought this to the forefront of making sure that we have more representation in the books that are written, the books that are published, and the books that are read. And so we're, you know, the publishing industry is working really hard on that. We, we have a ways to go in that we are seeing more diversity in the authors that are published, but we're still, ha- you know, up at those upper levels of where the editors are or the CEOs of the publishing companies, we're not seeing the diversity. So the people making the decisions, you know, we're still working to get a li- little bit more diversity there. But absolutely, it's critical for children to see themselves represented in literature in any of those three ways. Um, so, yeah, thank you for asking that. Yeah, and um, it's uh, we need diverse books, so we'll send uh, we'll put a link on there. Um, it is so so good to to also hear and see um, that perspective, and and you know the whole issue of diverse books is also as important in um, communities where there is not as much diversity. So again, as always, we have an opportunity uh, to share those rich rich books. Um, So, Teresa, you actually did talk about the difference, you know, a couple of these questions. Um, How about uh, at home, you know, for you each, uh, having uh, books in languages or a lot of, you know, in terms of stories that are, you know, special to you in, in your home and what it must mean to children and communities, the importance of having reading materials in your native language at home. Um, I think, Elisa, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for me, for me uh, grow, uh, growing up, like, books were always, like, very, very important. And my mom, I I never wanted to lose the sense of not being able to communicate with, like, my abuela, um, my tias, my madrinas. I never wanted to lose that sense. So I, you know, I always made sure to, like, speak Spanish and read in Spanish and write it. So I'm, you know, I'm happy to say that I can it still be I'm fluent in that because but it was more like the familia connection that made that important for me so I think um you know I I think definitely reading to children in in their native but what that family considers to be their native language I think it's it's great and not only are you 
are you encouraging like pride in their culture, but also just um, it's just a, a nice learning experience. I, I think it's it's something and it makes them see that there's so much diversity in this in this world, whether you choose a bilingual book or a book that's um, fully just in, in Spanish or translated title. I think I think that's fine. I think it's just, you know, just building that pride in there and like, you know, this is our culture and this is who you are and it's okay to be who you are and also just to, to teach others. So to me, um, in diversity, we have power. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm here for it. So just, I, that's just what I think. And I, I see the importance of, of that because it was, it was like instilled in me growing up. And that's something that I would like to I bring into my work. And, you know, and if in the future, if I have children, I definitely um, would want that to um, be part of, of their upbringing as well. And Laura, as a library teacher who's been, you know, <laughs> trying to put books into classroom and school libraries, you know, for all of these 26 years, you're, uh, are you seeing more? And, and the other thing that I, I am excited to see is books in other languages, um, books in native languages, indigenous languages as well. Um, and in the same way, as you pointed out today, so, you know, people who, I have a Honduran friend who speaks both, um, you know, um, she's Mosquito, as well as Hondurano. And so um, to be able to find, uh, to, to, to think about putting books in, you know, you may not find Mosquito books, but you understand that not everybody in the Spanish-speaking community who's coming into your community may all just only speak Spanish or may speak Spanish because that is a, another challenge. Um, for you, Laura, are you seeing more books in, you know, acknowledging both the indigenous side of, of, of communities, Spanish communities being another one, other communities um, that are in that multilingual, multicultural environment there for you, a very diverse part of uh, DC. Yes, we, um, in, in my library, I've, I've um, curated um, uh, English and Spanish and bilingual books. We, I don't have, and, and I'm really not, um, a specialist in or really familiar with books that are being published in in indigenous languages and it, and if that's happening that's very exciting um, but what I, I guess what I want to say is that when a child comes into a library um, and is looking for Spanish language books I believe they should have the option of a good translation. And finally, Dr. Seuss has been translated into fluent, flowing, humorous Spanish. The first translations were horrible, but they are getting much, much better. Um, uh, Yanitia Canetti is a translator that's just doing amazing things with Dr. Seuss in Spanish. Um, and she also has her own books that are sort of fractured fairy tales in Spanish. Um, I just also feel like I need to share this book, um, The Little Free Library, Little Library's Big Heroes. And the coincidence is this is very multicultural, but it's not just about books in Spanish. However, the illustrator, John Parra, is a Latinx illustrator. And they do speak about um, a little little free library um, project in El Paso, right on the border. Um, and it was started by a librarian, um, Ms. Lopez. I, I, her name is Lopez Williamson. Yeah, oh, you know yes. her. She's okay, fabulous. And yes. I'm sure you know this. I'm sure everyone knows this book. So I'm not. It's not like, ooh, look at this book. But it's <laughs> but it is really a lovely book, and it's a way to to share about the little free libraries. Um, I mentioned the bilingual books, but then there's also a whole bunch of authentic, I don't want to say authentic because all books are authentic, but books that are originally written in Spanish or in the case of Ana Maria Machado, she writes in Portuguese, she's Brazilian, and her books automatically come out in Portuguese and Spanish. 
And sometimes these books that are originally published in Mexico, in Argentina, in Venezuela, there's a really good um, publishing house, Ecare, um, they're hard to find. And, and that's a challenge. You have to kind of be a sleuth on the internet to figure out how to get these books. Some of them come up very easily and immediately on Amazon. Some don't. So, so it's, it's a challenge to, to put on your shelves the variety of books in Spanish, and that's really all that I know, um, that, that give children access to all different types of reading experiences. Um, in in Spanish or by yeah. yeah so what um what kinds of books and genres and authors are of interest to to multicultural kids and teenagers um, these days um, Laura and Elisa Teresa you know if you've been around yet what are kids um, looking for um, I, I think Laura go ahead Elisa. Well, I wanted to give Teresa the opportunity, and if we wanted yeah. to have a few things, to, I can go after Teresa. So that's no, Teresa, absolutely. Um, you know, it's really interesting because when I go into the schools, and, and granted, I live in a in a in a city that is predominantly a white city, um, but even when I talk to the kids that are children of color, they kids are kids. You know, they they all love Harry Potter. They love fantasy books. They love mystery books. They love books about animals. It's like there's, there's great consistency in young children in terms of what they're interested in, which is one reason why I think it's fabulous to expose them to different kinds of books because they're not, they're not terribly particular about who they read about. They want someone they can care about, a character they can care about. And so that gives us the opportunity to expose them to so many different cultures and different kinds of heroes because they're open to that and they're interested and it's a way for them to explore the world and and get outside of their, you know, their, their, their bubble that they live in. Um, the main reason why I translated the, the book into Spanish, there was two reasons. One, I work with a lot of nonprofit organizations that work with at-risk, low-income, and Latino families. And I kept getting the requests for a book in Spanish. And I realized that, you know, when my kids were little, I read to them every night, up until they were 14 years old. And... It, for these families, they wanted to be able to read something with their children. And and if their kids were a little older and didn't want to read with mom, at least they could read the same book as their child so that they could talk about it and have a conversation about that book. And with my book being set in America, it gave them a chance to learn some American history and to talk about that, what was San Antonio like during World War II. And the second reason for translating the book was that I was going into these classrooms where there were students who were newly arrived from Latin America barely spoke any English at all. They have to listen to me do my presentation in English. They're in an English-speaking school all day long. I'm giving free books to the children that all the kids are excited to read, but they couldn't necessarily read those books along with their peers. So it became really important to me to have a Spanish translation of the same book so that they could experience reading that same story alongside their peers at the same time and participate in that reading experience. That was the other main reason why we translated the book. So, yeah, kids are very open to all different kinds of literature, and I think that's it's wide open for us to expose them to so many things. And you have wonderful authors, like uh, in addition to you, you know, Yuji Morales, who does these really wonderful books and um, for oh, older teenagers, Elizabeth Acevedo, you know, just the language and the, the culture that comes out of, of the communities. Elisa, um, you, you know, gave the floor to Teresa. I'd love to hear what you were going to say. Yeah, so, you know, this could be like a whole conversation about the acquiring of materials and, and the publishers and, and vendors that we work with, but... Um, because there, there's stuff out there, but, you know, like uh, like Laura mentioned, you have to, like, really, you know, like, really search and dig. Yes. But, it, but it's out there. But it would be very interesting to have a conversation about acquiring these titles and stuff. But I wanted to say with, um, so I agree with Teresa, yes, so kids just want to, they just want to read. And they want to feel seen and represented. But, for example, from my work and working, what I've seen is, like, 
they want to read a lot of the cool, popular YA titles that are in English. So I'm so I'm always so glad when I'm able to provide uh, teens with you know this is uh, a fault in the, the fault in our stars or this particular title or like the um, you know any other of these like any of these other fame like really famous YA authors or popular books they want to read. So it's nice to, for them to have that. Um, translation, uh, you know, to have graphic novels or comic books translated um, into Spanish. So I think this is, they're asking really for the same books that our English speaking kids want, and it's just the flexibility in their language. So I think, so that definitely uh, to me is, is very important to have those those translations there and and for and you know and, and also books in like their native and and then or original work there's there's a lot of original work so I think because you know we, it, again it's a very long conversation but there is yeah. original work from that we can purchase or get from other um, from other vendors or publishers and stuff so there is a lot of you know Laura mentioned um, some some publishers so yeah so it's just out it's just acquiring the materials but also I think also not going in the mindset like oh this kid is just coming from a Latin American country and they're it's like their life is this and this and this and this and they need to read about this and this is no they just want to read so give them the opportunity to go into a whole new world that it's not like the same story over and over again about, oh, you know, immigrant families or my families at the border. Right. You know, kids, they, they want to read. So that I'm a big advocate for reading outside of these themes as well. And I lastly just also wanted to add that I'm also happy to see more stories by Dominican American writers telling the story of, of Dominican families. So there's different ones. So which was something that was not when I was growing up, we really didn't really didn't see. So I'm I'm happy about that and seeing that representation. So so yeah, so I think we need to stop just putting kids in a box about they just want to read the same story and over and over again. They just you know what they those kids want to read about dinosaurs too. So yeah. yeah. And then the other thing is you just if you like this book, this fantasy there's another one rooted in a different culture altogether that is really fabulous. And it would expose the child to other types of characters and traditions and rhythms and stories. I, I think that's also, and that gets to representation. You know, what does it mean to you mm. now to see or not see? What does that mean to you not see that represented your, um, your identity or culture? And, and what do you think? Um, today, so let's start with you. Oh, gosh, that's a great question. Because when I, I was growing up, um, there were not books that I was reading that had Mexican-American main characters, really. I mean, you could find like a folk story or that sort of thing. And my mom would search those out. But I don't remember as a kid really seeing myself represented that much in literature. Um, I was talking to some kids the other day about how much I loved Speedy Gonzalez when I was a kid. Because <laughs> Speedy Gonzalez was Mexican and he dressed like a peasant, but he wasn't the peasant with his head down and the sombrero taking a nap. He was the one outsmarting the, you know, the enemy and running around and he <laughs> was a hero. And these kids don't know who Speedy Gonzalez is. Um, so that's like my minor example of seeing something that I could take pride in. And yeah, he's the Mexican guy and he's going out and, and just feeling really proud of that. So I do think that um, it was harder when we were younger. There's so many more books now. And there's books, even um, authors that are writing about challenging aspects of the Latino culture, which, you know, there's a book, there's a couple books now about um, – main characters whose parents are facing deportation because they're undocumented. So yeah. books like um, Look Both Ways in the Barrio Blanca or uh, A Light in the a Star in the Forest, those are books about um, families that are facing challenges as, as undocumented families. And I think that's yes. amazing. Would not have seen that when I was growing up. Yeah. Yeah, like um, Return to Sender by Julia Alvarez, who's a, a Dominican-American yes. writer. Mm -hmm. um, get two quick things to, to think about. Um, when you look at books that are originally 
um, published in Spanish, you do have to look for representation in them because sometimes um, these books literally, um, and I'm talking mainly from Spain, and that is the vast majority of a lot from Barcelona. But, but that doesn't mean that the kids in the book are going to be representative of, of many cultures. And, and, and so you have to be a little bit careful. It, it doesn't mean that the books shouldn't be read. It's just a question of like looking at them with a critical eye. And, um, and the other, I guess I wanted to bring up Pan, Pan Munoz Ryan, this book Echo. Yes. This is like one of my son's very favorite books that he's ever read. Um, it has an America's Award and a Newbery Honor. And, um, and Pam Munoz Ryan is a great example of what, Anita, you were talking about, these amazing um, Latinx writers, Esperanza Rising. I mean, we all know Esperanza that. Esperanza Rising, yeah. And we know um, uh, Yo Soy Naomi Leon. But this echo... It, it actually, as I'm, if you haven't read it, it's amazing to read, and it does talk about the Mexican-American community in California during World War II and the relationship between the Mexican-Americans and then the Japanese-Americans who were getting sent to camps. Um, but that's only one of the three stories. There's three stories, and, and one is of a a Jewish kid in Nazi Germany, okay? And then there's two poor orphan brothers. And um, so this is just an example of some of the magical literature that's coming out. And it is, it is translated into Spanish, but it's written first in English because these yeah. authors are, um, they're writing their first language probably is English because that this is where they've grown up. And I, th I think the other thing is is looking at um, publishers. Hopefully, there are publishers that are not just going to be from Spain. That that books in Spanish are are really coming from within. I, I, I think that was the exciting thing for me about Archipelago Press is that it is centered here and bringing up books that were um, based from the community. I think um, the the point actually uh, the funny point of, uh, that you were making, Teresa, about Speedy Gonzalez is now identifying with somebody who's in who is part of your culture, or not quite culture, but, um, but something that you're just trying to hold on to as a, as a kid, seeing yourself or a story. I think that's the richer part of what people are beginning to discover. So one of the things to, to, to the stewards is look and look at these publishers. We've put a lot of resources on here from, um, you know, Colin Colorado, you know, actually, First Books Marketplace has a wonderful resources. The, you know, Reforma has a list. ALA has a list. We have recommended reading lists. There are authors out there telling stories like you, Teresa. You know, we're out there trying to, you know, really reach so many. I think that's the exciting thing about seeing ourselves represented in the pages and even just a snippet snippet of culture, you know, whether it's in my culture saying somebody said lumpia in a book, oh my God, there's lumpia, or, you know, or arepas is in a book now. So, you know, those things, food connects, finding the types of books that help your communities um, be, feel seen. I love that you were mentioning the immigrant story because the immigrant story is rich. It's, it's, it's from, you know, the farm workers who toil to, you know, people who've come out and just sacrificed a lot to, you know, bring their, their children up. Um, but, and they also, I love what you said, Elisa, about the fact that, you know, just because you speak another language doesn't mean you're not intelligent because you're learning English, because you have intelligence in so many ways in life experience, but also your intelligence is rooted in your culture. And so that's another way to bring your culture forward into um, a classroom or a library or a book talk. I think that's the exciting thing is, is the sharing of more books, of more stories. I, I am so, so pleased and grateful that all of you have, have been part of this rich conversation. So I'll leave you with one comment that you want to make to all these stewards, a moment of encouragement or a suggestion for them 
um, and then we will um, we will close out my my final comment. But I I just am so grateful that all of you have uh, and chimed in on all of this. We'll start um, with you. Uh, we'll start with Laura, then Alisa, then Teresa. We get to close this out as a as a motivational and wonderful blogger speaker. So Laura, what would you say as a steward too? <laughs> yes. Well, as a steward, and and as and in speaking to my fellow stewards all over the the country, maybe in the world. Uh, um, yes. Yes. It's it's wonderful to be to have access to books in many languages. I think Spanish probably is the most prevalent in terms of our 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 um, you know uh, language. I don't want to say language minority, but Spanish is is probably the Perfect. language that most families would be looking for and excited to see in a little free library. And um, you can you can really find amazing titles, all the all the websites that and Anita just mentioned. Um, and you know, and there's a, a there's wonderful ways to to now you know purchase used books. Right. Yeah. And so you just need that, like, if you have a list and you have maybe a little bit of money or someone has donated some money, you can um, it books are books in Spanish, bilingual books are more and more accessible. And I I want to echo Anita's mention of Lee and Lowe. They are absolutely incredible. If you've not been to their website, they're amazing. They have great resources. Elisa, the floor is yours. Um, well, uh, first I want to say um, thank you to all the stewards for being champions of literacy and diversity. So, you know, just keep up the, the good work with that. Um, also, you know, just want to put in a plug for the public libraries. Um, so make sure that you connect with your public libraries and, um, and also, you know, tell those librarians if you're not seeing uh, some diverse titles or, or a collection that's connecting with the community, make sure that you um, speak out to that, but um, but yeah, really just um, thankful for all the stewards and the work that you're all doing and um, and just, you know, being champions of literacy and diversity and welcoming all all peoples and, and, and cultures, so I am definitely um, celebrating that. Thank you. And Teresa? Well, I am a huge fan of Little Free Libraries, and my company, we're actually donating a library to a neighborhood where my translator lives that is uh, mostly Latino families, and we're going to stock it with books that are in Spanish and bilingual books and English books. And, you know, for me, my, my main area of advocacy is around book ownership, because we know that when kids own books in their home, that they are more likely to read at grade level by third grade, they're more likely to score higher on standardized tests. And they're even more likely to graduate high school. So yeah. I, we can't overemphasize how important it is to own a book, to have a book that you love, that you can keep returning to. And what I love about Little Free Libraries is, it, you know, it's allowed for a child to love a book so much that they keep it and they don't return it to that library. And, you know, other people are restocking the library. And, you know, I have friends that drive around town dropping off books in Little Free Libraries that their kids have outgrown. So I love that that gives children the opportunity to, if they really connect with the book, to own it and keep it and revisit it and just, you know, increase those literacy skills through something that matters to them. So thank you. Thank you for the work you do. Thank you. And I just also want to make a plug. Little Free Libraries, these stewards are, are truly amazing. If you do events, don't forget that you have events that you can have your community or children write their stories, place them in your little free library, share those stories, tell them um, that the richness of a parent's story as well, have them write something together that becomes part of the lore of your little free library. I, I think it's great. One little tip for you, because I always go into thrift stores as a little free library advocate oh, yeah, yeah. steward, go into thrift stores, look in that Spanish speaking section, look in, uh, there may be French books, there may be others, and you can find a lot of treasures that won't be too much. Your librarians, libraries, are great sources for you. Um, they are often our angels in terms of book donations. <laughs> and also, you know, talk to them, talk to the librarians, talk to people, but also have that conversation. I think Alisa says, you know, if they're not placing um, diverse books, 
ask for them. Make it a part of your conversation. I think that that is where we all work together. I love that it's an author, a teacher, a librarian, all of us all on this um, panel together. If you've enjoyed this episode of Little Free Library Unbound, um, please consider donating to Little Free Library. This has begun a real treasure, I think, for all of us to share voices and to hear suggestions. Um, you can donate today at littlefreelibrary.org slash donate. Um, you know, share the love of what we all are doing. You realize that we are now hitting almost 200,000 little free library, libraries around the world. It is a community of book sharers and book uh, lovers, and it's a family. So join us if you're not part of one. Um, I thank you all. It's just been such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. And Shelby, take it away. <laughs> Lexi, thank you so much <laughs> to our panelists today and to you, Anita, and to everyone for tuning in. It has been such a pleasure, as always, to hear from everyone come together. Um, thank you, thank you. It's, it's such a pleasure to be here um, with all of you. Um, as Anita mentioned, um, we have show notes that we will be providing uh, with all the great links and resources we mentioned um, today, those will come to you in your inbox um, in the next couple of days, and um, we will also share the recording of this event so that you can check it out again, you can share it with your networks, um, you can share it with someone who wasn't able to make it live, um, and the most exciting part is our giveaway. We do a giveaway every month with Unbound, and this month we are offering five bilingual book bundles. Um, so be sure to click the link in the follow-up email you get from this event um, to take a quick survey, tell us what you thought about the event, and if you want to be entered to win those books. So that'll be five great bilingual books that you can use to stock your library um, and hopefully reach someone new in your neighborhood. Um, I realize we went a little bit late this time, so thank you so much for hanging in there. It was such a fabulous conversation. Um, and I always, Anita and I always say we could stay here talking for hours and hours to our great, our great panelists. Um, you can register for next month's episode of Unbound at the link in the chat. And um, if you haven't already, we encourage you to follow us on our social media. We're on all the social media. Um, Shelby's got links to those in the chat as well as a link to our e-newsletter, um, which includes information about our program fun stuff we're doing, giveaways, um, Little Free Library Unbound News, and all co other kinds of fun stuff like that. So be sure to sign up for that to hear from us um, when we do our newsletter. Thank you so much again for being here, and we will see you next time. <laughs>